Good morning, friends. Welcome to Walking Through His Word on this February 25th, 2022. Crazy to think about where we are at today. I want to say welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that you're with me. I see some friends popping on live here on Instagram. I see my friend Malia and Mama T and my parents are here with me. And I'm trying out something a little bit new here on Facebook today. I'm using StreamYard. We've had lots of problems with the technology on Facebook, so I'm hoping that this will be a little bit better. And if you are watching live today, I just want to encourage you to just send a little wave or a hello. Let me know what city you are joining from, and that lets me know also if you can hear me okay with this new uh, broadcasting technology that I'm going to be using my goal is that all of you can just hear me and be able to participate in a meaningful way this morning. Um, good morning to Alicia and Janine. I see that you're here as well. And I want to say hello to my friends who are joining from the Widow Mama Collective, as well as the Glory Chasers Christian Running Group. I'm super grateful that we can come together today, and especially with what is going on in the world. Um, I think it is so important for us to join our hearts in prayer and of course, to start with God's word. So if you're new around here, what I um, love doing is just really being able to walk through the Bible verse by verse, to look at scripture and to see what can we learn about God and what can we learn about ourselves? What's some practical application that we can find? Um, so that's what we like to do around here. I encourage you to open your Bibles with me if you have the space to do that. I'm going to be in Psalm 73 today. And I know that some of you like to listen to this when you are walking or running or commuting. And I love that. Um, I love that we would just fill our minds with God's truth and with prayer, even as we are moving our bodies. And I like to do that um, myself. I love to listen to worship music when I am doing those things. And sometimes I like to listen to the Bible through the YouVersion app. That's another suggestion for you all. If you want to hear God's word and you're more of an auditory learner, one of my daughters actually is more auditory in the way that she learns. And so I encourage you get out that you version Bible app. Um, there's also a new podcast called truth's table where, um, women are reading God's word. And I love hearing their voices. I love hearing maybe a little bit different, um, just emphasis and intonation. It's very inspiring. I know some people also like the Dwell app. That's another way that you can listen to God's Word, and they use some calming music that goes along with it. So those are just some ideas. Um, good morning to my friend Sarah, who is here from Thailand. I'm so glad that you can hear me, and Joshua. Um, I am so glad that you could be with us live today. I'm from Visalia as well. So we're going to go ahead and dive into Psalm 73. And today, you know, especially with what has been going on in the world, I wanted to dedicate our time to praying for Ukraine. So I'm going to go through the Psalm and then we're going to pray over the situation that is happening in Ukraine. I, um, my heart has been grieving. Uh, my heart in some ways has felt overwhelmed and I, I pray that God would use the words of Psalm 73 to challenge us today, as he always does. I do not orchestrate, you know, what happens on which week, but it seems that these Psalms always fall just in God's timing. And I also want to celebrate a little bit today because as I was thinking about it last night, I started this broadcast when things shut down for the pandemic. And so that was 100 weeks ago, 100 weeks ago that we started meeting in this way, reading God's word, praying together. So we have just a couple of weeks until we have that two year anniversary of the shutdown. And it's kind of amazing to me to think about being able to come together in this way, in freedom, using technology, that for 100 weeks we could pray without ceasing. There's a couple of exceptions on weeks that I, I did take breaks, but it's kind of just um, astonishing and something I do want to celebrate because I 
believe that there is power in prayer. And that's why I keep showing up to do this. And that's why I'm so grateful so many of you have showed up with me through the weeks. Friends, let's go ahead and dive into Psalm 73. And I am going to be reading from the ESV version to start with, and then um, probably bringing in some other translations here if my computer will let me. So Psalm 73 is a Psalm of Asaph. And just to give a little context before we dive in, this is a wisdom psalm. The wisdom psalms are a group of psalms that actually often talk about this theme of a contrast between the wicked and the righteous. And it also talks about this theme of the brevity of life. And so just giving us some awareness of those two themes. Let's dive in. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice loftily. They threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them fall to ruin how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, and I may tell of all your works. Friends, that's Psalm 73 today that we are looking at. And I want to say welcome to some of you who just jumped on here um, on Instagram. Grateful that you're with us. I love um, how this psalm... And this is not a psalm of David, it's a psalm of Asaph. But this psalm invites us in to the tension, invites us in to think about what is our theology. And so we might say that one of the overarching themes of Psalm 73 is this idea that God is my strength and my portion. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, actually, recognizing that God is our strength and our portion. But you know what? That doesn't come at the beginning of the psalm. That doesn't come till the end, near the end here of 27 and 28 verses. And so let's dive into what we can learn from the early part and what this psalmist is really grappling with here. So I always like to ask the question of the test text, what can we learn about God? And right out of the gate, we see that Asaph is calling out something very important about God. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Truly God is good. 
And so the goodness of God sets the stage for this song. It is a reminder as we enter in. And in the CSB version, actually, this is my Tony Evans study Bible, which is one of my favorites to refer to. It says, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. And so, again, we see this contrast that Asaph is setting up between the righteous and the wicked, the pure in heart, and those who do not have good motives, those who do not believe in God. Um, and so let's notice what happens then from here. In verses 2 through 12, we have an, an interesting section here because Asaph is actually expressing the conflict between his theology and his experience. And what he's saying basically is that he envies the wicked. He is envying the arrogant. He's puzzled by why are the wicked prospering? Why are those who have evil intentions, why do they seem to be successful? I wonder, friends, is that a question that you've ever asked? Maybe just uh, put a little emoji in the comments if that's something that you've ever thought about or ever grappled with, maybe struggled with. We see in these verses that Asaph brings his frustration and his confusion to God. I'm going to read a couple of the verses just to remind us. It says, verse 3, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. <laughs> okay, um, we get to see that Asaph is like serious here. He is emotional about this. We see this really strong imagery that he is looking on those who are wicked, those who are evil, and he's seeing that they are fat and they are sleek, and it seems like they are not encountering any trouble. Well, um, what do we know to be true about that? We know that all of us, no matter which camp we put ourselves in the righteous or the wicked camp, we know that all of us face trouble and that all of us face trials and that even the most powerful and the most famous in our world and our cultures, um, we, we see that they are struggling. They have emotional and mental struggles and you know, we've seen um, leaders and actors who have committed suicide, who have um, had to deal with stress and depression and anxiety that sometimes is not seen from the outside. And so I want us to keep that in mind that even though when we look at something or we looked at, at someone and we think, well, why are they prospering? When they're being prideful, when they're being wicked, when they're being evil, when they're taking advantage of other people, let's remember that the struggle may still be there. So as we go on with these verses, it says in, let's see, I read through verse 7. Um, it says in verse 8, they scoff and speak with malice loftily. They threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? And so again, we see that Asaph is grappling with this idea that there is not justice here, that the wicked are not being punished for their motives, um, that they you know, are not receiving that what they have due to them. But then we see this turning point in the psalm, and I think this is really interesting. We see this a lot of times in the different psalms of David, where there is a turning point. And I'll say that in this, in this psalm, it happens really in verse 17. I think I said 12 originally, but in verse 17. So I'm going to back up and write and read for you verse 16. It says, but when I thought... How to understand this? It seemed to me a wearisome task. So he's growing weary with trying to understand how there is justice in the world. And then in 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I discerned their end. So this is very fascinating here because we see that Asaph is struggling. He's trying to figure this out. Where is the justice in all of this? And then what he does is he pivots, he turns, and he goes into the sanctuary of God. 
And so, you know, whether this met is metaphorically or literally, what he is doing is he is turning himself towards God. He is entering into God's presence. And when he enters into God's presence, he begins to see through a different lens. Isn't that true, friends? That when we pause and when we pivot towards God, that sometimes he can illuminate a situation that in a way that we didn't see before. If you've ever had that happen to you, just say hello in the comments, drop an emoji or even a couple of words. Has that ever happened to you where you were confused, you were overwhelmed, where you were just absolutely flabbergasted at what was happening in the world and wondering why the evil would prosper those are the times when we have to pivot and turn to God, when we have to sit in his presence, when we have to sit in his peace, because peace is a person, capital P, peace. And I am so grateful and agreeing with my friend Rachel here on Instagram, praise God for his word that comforts and corrects us. So here we see in 17, this turning point and listen to his language. He says, truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. Oh, Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. And so it's interesting here that now Asaph is realizing that actually there is destruction for the wicked. And he's looking on this with an eternal perspective. He's remembering that the reward is in heaven. He's remembering that the reward is salvation. And so we see that he is even recognizing in humility that he was acting like an ignorant fool, like he was acting brutish, like a beast. He uses the word a beast. And then he also recognizes that even in his confusion, even in his frustration, that God is with him. And I love this metaphor that is all throughout scripture that says that God was holding his right hand, that God was continually with him. Friends, let's remind ourselves of that today. God is holding our hand. When someone is holding our hand, maybe it is um, a spouse or a boyfriend or someone that we love, or maybe it's a parent to a child. When we hold each other's hands, there's something special that happens there. It's a support that's offered. It's an intimacy that's offered. And to think about that God of the universe, that he actually is holding our hand that he supports us in that way. And then in verse 24, I love that it says, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. So I believe here is a reminder to us that God is our guide. And as it says in the New Testament, that he is our helper. Many times in reference to the Holy Spirit, as Jesus even described the Holy Spirit coming, saying that he would be our helper that he would be our guide. And so that we can cling to him even in this present day, in these troubles that we face, even in the midst of a pandemic and war in our world, that we can seek guidance from God, that he is our guide and he is the one we should go to first. Not the news, not the podcasts, not what our friends are posting on Instagram or Twitter, but to God and to his word, which holds true through the ages, my friends. And then it says, afterward, you will receive me to glory. And I love this word glory. You know that this is one of the words I've studied a lot and written Bible studies about and written books about. This word glory here in this place, I believe, refers to heaven. It says, you will receive me to glory. So not only do we get glimpses of his glory here on earth, glimpses of God at work, even in the midst of our trials, but we also get to have this future-minded reward that in heaven, we get to receive the glory, that we get to enter into glory. And so again, we might say capital G glory here, meaning heaven, that the, the evil and the wicked will pass away. Um, and that's not even for us to worry about. We're not the judge. God in heaven is the judge. And so 
Friends, we can take heart in that. In John 16, 33, it says that in this world, we will have trouble, but to take heart because Jesus, who is speaking in those verses, has overcome the world. And we get the privilege of living this side of the cross so we know that there is redemption and we get to look forward to what it describes in Revelation that Jesus is coming back again to rule. Um, So friends, I wanna just conclude with these final verses that are really the theme of Psalm 73. It says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If you want to just say amen to that, just type it in the comments. Amen. God is our strength. When we feel weak, he is our strength. When we feel like we are in want, when we are in need, he is our portion. And this psalm so beautifully declares that for us. And then we see in the conclusion in verses 27 and 28 that Asaph himself is moved to action. He says, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. So he's calling out the truth that God is the judge. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. And so this final character quality of God, we have learned from the beginning that he is good, that he can handle our hot mess, our frustration, everything that we are going through, our confusion, And then we see in Asaph that God's presence changes everything. And so when we pivot towards God, when we actually move our bodies and move our focus and move our eyes towards God and specifically his word, we find refuge, we find strength, we find that he is our portion forever. And maybe we don't have all the answers of why these things are happening in our world or in our personal life. But we can rest in knowing that he is our refuge, my friends. Let's type that in the comments right now. Refuge, that word refuge. I want us to center on that. It is a war term, the word refuge. And refuge is a place of safety. It's a place of safety that we are sheltered, that we can rest. So I'm grateful for that. Now I want to move into a time of prayer today remembering these things that we have learned about God, remembering how Asaph pivoted, how in the midst of his confusion, God welcomed him, that he could cry out to God his frustration, creating this contrast between the righteous and the wicked and how he saw, hey, this isn't fair. Why are they prospering? Why are they getting success? Why do they have these fat, sleek bodies all the way to death? But then how he remembers that death is not the end, that actually there is a heavenly reward and that God receives us into glory. What encouragement there is for us in that. He is our refuge. Friends, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna go ahead and pray. And and as always, I wanna invite you, if you have any personal requests, things that are going on in your community or your city or that are burdening your heart, to share those in the comments. And I'm going to specifically start with a a prayer for Ukraine because my heart is burdened for what is going on there. Join me. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of coming together with these friends across the internet for 100 weeks that we would pray without ceasing for 100 more. God, I'm so grateful for the friends who come to encourage me every week through their comments. And we all represent different places, different cultures, different families. Lord, I'm so aware that even this could be a picture, a glimpse of your glory, that we would come together in this way, not just across the central California where I live, but my friend Sarah joining me from Thailand and Joshua from Visalia, and my friends who are here from Chicago and who are here from Atlanta and from San Francisco. Lord, we join our hearts today and we say thank you. We say thank you that you are good, that you are a good God. Would you remind us, even in the times when our hearts feel downtrodden, that you are good, God that you work all things together for good. 
and that sometimes we don't see all the details of that. We might not even understand it, this side of heaven, but that we can trust you in that, Lord. I thank you, God, that you can handle our questions. I am with Asaph in mulling over these questions. Lord, thank you that we can pour out our fears and anxiety, our grief to you. I'm grateful that you are a God who welcomes us to lament, that you grieve alongside us, that just as Jesus wept with Mary and Martha over the death of their brother, that you weep with us, that you weep when the vulnerable and the innocent are being taken advantage of, God. So we pray over what is happening in Ukraine right now, Lord. I don't want to even venture into all of the politics of it, but I do want to pray for the people who are vulnerable, the people of Ukraine who are being attacked right now. God, I pray that you would empower them with your strength. And as it says in Psalm 73 that we just read, Lord, I pray that in a personal way that they would feel that you are the strength of their hearts, that you are their portion forever. Yesterday I was watching the news and I, I saw an interview with a mom who was there with her 10 year old son, Lord, and I saw courage. I saw courage in her. And I don't pretend to know the details of her story, Lord, but I know that you are the one who can infuse courage in us. And so anyone who is afraid right now, Lord, I pray that you would infuse them with that supernatural courage, that you would give them clarity of mind of what to do and where to go. God, we pray for the world leaders. We pray for those who are in places of power who can make decisions on this matter. God, we pray that you would use them for your glory. And even if they do not serve you, even if they are not seeking your counsel, God, we trust you. We trust that you can intervene even in those situations. God, I pray for um, our military as they're preparing for what might be to come for those families who are impacted by that. I pray for the Christian workers who are in Ukraine and who are working abroad. God, we pray for protection for them. We pray that even in this time of destruction and war and fear, that your gospel would go out, that the gospel of peace would be present, that people would turn and pivot to you in the way that Asaph did here in Psalm 73 that we read, that they would be able to pivot to you and your presence and that your presence would bring a sense of peace. I pray that if there is anyone who does not know you in a personal way, God, that this would be an opportunity for them to turn their hearts to you. We pray that in boldness. We pray that in faith. We pray that knowing that in times of trouble that people get to meet you. I pray also for my friends here, um, right here in the Central Valley, many of them who have family members who are in Ukraine. And I think about uh, my friend Luda, my friend Mila and Marina, and um, for those who are worried about their loved ones and not knowing if they are safe or if they are okay, God, I pray that you would calm their hearts. Would you give them strength to pray and to intervene? Would you give them a glimmer of hope, a glimpse of your glory today, that even in the midst of this difficult situation that you are working, Lord Jesus. We're so grateful for that, that we can trust you in that. I also continue to pray for those who are affected by COVID, Lord. I know there are still some who are sick, who have been infected with the Omicron variant, who are in the hospitals. I pray, Lord, that um, that you would be with them. And I know that there are also many, including my family, who have lost loved ones these last couple of years to COVID. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for those who are walking through that valley of the shadow of death. But knowing, Lord, that we can fear no evil, that you are with us, Lord, as it says in Psalm 22, 23. Lord, thank you that you are our shepherd, that you guide us. 
I'm also joining a couple of my friends here who are sharing some prayer requests in the comments. Um, we are praying for our friend who needs a move for her husband's job, that it's, um, it's the fifth time that this family is moving in seven years, Lord, that's exhausting. And so I pray for unhurried presence here on Instagram and her family. God, I'm just praying that you would give them perseverance, that you would lift their eyes to see maybe even a new opportunity here that they have as they are moving to get to know you and to point others to you. Lord, thank you that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Thank you that you are our refuge. And I just declare, as it says in verse 28 here, that we will tell of your works. I pray that you would press on all of our hearts, those who are listening today, that you would remind us of the ways that you have been faithful to us and that we would have courage to tell others about that story today, maybe through a text, maybe through a conversation, maybe through a phone call, that we would declare your works, Lord, that we would point others to you. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you so much for being with me this morning. Uh, my heart's been heavy, and honestly, I was looking forward to this time that we could come together to pray for what is going on in our world. As always, I wanna encourage you that you can reach out to me, um, whether it's through DMs on Instagram or through my inbox over on Facebook. If you have personal requests, I'm honored. I'm always honored when you reach out to me personally. I also love to keep in touch with my people personally through my Glorygram, which is a weekly letter that I send out on the weekends. And uh, usually by Saturday night, night, you'll get a delivery of your Glorygram. If you hop over to DorenaGilmore.com, you can sign up for that just right there if you share your email. And I know sometimes the internet gets noisy. I know sometimes we need to take a break from social media. And so that's my way that I can really just share some words of encouragement with you and some great recommendations. Um, every week, I always like to share a recommendation for a book or a resource. And this week, I wanted to share with you this is a magazine called Everyday Faith. You can find it at Target and dayspring.com. And um, this is actually a magazine that I write for. My beautiful friend, Arti Sequeira, is on the cover. You may remember her. She was the next Food Network star winner back in 2010. And I am excited because in this issue, I actually have an article that I wrote about hospitality. And so you will see some pictures of my family, and it talks about that hospitality is more than entertaining and how just being in the pandemic has taught me a lot about what Bible-inspired hospitality looks like. So I hope you will look for this magazine on the newsstands or you can buy it online. And once again, hop over to DorenaGilmore.com and share with me your email. I would love to just get to know you a little bit better um, through my weekly Glorygram. Friends, thanks for being with me. God go with you this weekend. And don't forget to take a look at Psalm 73 on your own. There's so much goodness in it. We just scratched the surface.